Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to yet another session of In Dialogue Foundation Certificate Course in Dialogue Studies 2023 2024. We have the pleasure of having with us today Dr. Saad Ismail. He would be speaking on uh, interact uh, on Al Biruni and the study of religion pointers for interfaith dialogue. Uh, Dr. Saad Ismail is a resident in the Department of Physiology. Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College, Aligarh, uh, Aligarh Muslim University. He is the founder and editor of Project Noon, a forum dedicated to improving Hindu-Muslim mutual understanding through philosophical, theological, as well as faith-based engagements. He has engaged leading scholars and academics on Indic, Hindu and Muslim traditions through extended podcasts, in-depth essays and reviews, and webinars and workshops. Dr. Saad's writings have appeared in journals such as Critical Muslim, First Publishers UK, and he has presented various papers at conferences on philosophy, religion, and medicine. In August 2023, Project Noon collaborated with the Cambridge Interfaith Program to organize a month-long online introduction to Hindu socio-religious traditions with Dr. Ankur Barwa of Cambridge University. We welcome you, Dr. Ismail. And uh, we are very glad to have you. So uh, over to you. Thank you. Well, uh, firstly, thank you for the kind invitation uh, and for everyone who's joining here. Uh, when I first heard about the uh, in dialogue group and the uh, course that is going on, uh, I found it really fascinating, and I'm really honored to be able to speak with this group uh, in whatever capacity I can. Uh, although I should uh, begin this my discussion with the small caveat that uh, uh, although I have been involved in uh, uh, studying religion at an academic level uh, or you know dealing with these questions uh, in a academic or semi-academic manner uh, I I am myself not based in any of these departments uh, as you know I'm uh, in the medical college at AMU uh, and so uh, for those who uh, I take it uh, many in the audience have already done PhDs on, on perhaps on, on similar themes. So uh, some of the element, some of the material might seem somewhat elementary, uh, but please uh, humor me for that uh, duration. And uh, uh, I hope, uh, based on my own uh, experiences at Project Noon, which, uh, as you uh, pointed out, is something I can elaborate on uh, later. Uh, these are some reflections and some uh, pointers which I which I'd like to share based on my own studies. So, can I uh, share my screen? Good now. Right. Uh, today's discussion is based on uh, an essay which we had uh, circulated in, in advance with the group, uh, uh, and many of you might have read that you know relatively brief essay. Uh, I won't be going into what I've covered in that essay. Uh, uh, but this builds on so, some of the themes which come up over there and just develop some of those themes. Uh, so this uh, is based on, of course, uh, as you might be aware, uh, this really popular book, uh, well-known book by uh, Al-Biruni, written about 1,000 years ago, uh, but which is still considered uh, uh, a great resource on uh, medieval India. Uh, and this is the, I, th I think the 1890 translation, it's still the most available translation today. Uh, we'll discuss uh, a few pointers from this book in terms of engaging, uh, in terms of inter-religious and interfaith engagement. Uh, although this book deals with various other themes such as of various, uh, various branches of Indian science, uh, uh, regional customs, et cetera. Uh, we won't go into detail in those aspects. We'll, we are focused on this book from the point of view of interfaith dialogue and certain principles which uh, emerge uh, in when when we encounter al Biruni's method. So we are not dealing with al Biruni's details, which can be uh, contested uh, because he was writing with limited source material. But we what we are really more interested in is the method rather than the details. This is something I want to keep I want us to keep in mind as we move forward. Now, before we uh, begin, uh, there is, uh, of course, the popular association 
in our imaginations between Al-Biruni on the one hand and Mahmoud of Ghaznir on the other, who uh, uh, was a patron of Al-Biruni, clearly. Uh, and he is associated, uh, well, I mean, the, both the scholar and the emperor have different legacies and have diff are known for different things. Uh, so at the outset, uh, this is just one point which I'd like to clarify before we, or I'd like to highlight before we move on. Uh, Biruni himself had, had a very ambivalent relationship with Mahmoud Ghazni. Uh, he found himself compelled to join the court, uh, the Ghaznavid court, when the armies captured Khwarizm in 1017. Khwarizm is in Central Asia, uh, and uh, Biruni is originally from Khwarizm, and then he, uh, when the Ar Ghaznavid armies captured Khwarizm, uh, they, they took some of the uh, Khwarizmi intellectuals as loot, among other things. Uh, Al Biruni writes about the you know horror of the terror of that time of that that uh, annexation. Uh, he says the gallows were set up, and the leaders of the rebellion were thrown in front of the elephants so that they would be killed by them. Then they were impaled on their tusks so that they could be displayed. Really horrific, uh, terrific imagery. Uh, also, George Malagaris in his uh, recent uh, Oxford University Press publication on Al Biruni points this out that it should put to rest uh, the suggestion that Biruni could easily refuse a request to join the Ghaznavid court after they had directly occupied his homeland. Biruni did not go of his own accord with Mahmoud of Ghazni, rather he became a special kind of human loot. This is uh, a point which comes up in uh, George Malagaris's book, which if you can see over here, uh, is was published uh, about two years ago. Uh, and it's also relatively cheap uh, in its paperback in India. Uh, with that brief caveat, uh, let's contextualize the scholar slightly more before we deal directly with his book. Uh, of course, Al-Biruni is writing uh, in a larger tradition of intercultural or uh, cross-cultural scholarship. But again, this cross-cultural scholarship, which was developing in Muslim uh, uh, intellectual writing in medieval times was of broadly two varieties. So you had, on the one hand, scholars such as Jahiz of Basra, Ibn Hazm of Cordoba, uh, and Shia writers such as Nobakhti, Ibn Badhuba, whose interest in other religions and sects is almost wholly polemical. Uh, but in historians such as Yaqubi Masoodi, there is evidence evident interest in recording facts about the religions of surrounding peoples without any special polemical intent. In fact, in the works of some writers, the encyclopedias such as Fahris, the, the Encyclopedia Fahris of al nadim or the Bayan al Adiyan of Abu Ma'ali, the interest in other religions is so frankly in the religions themselves that the authors tended to come under suspicion of not being very good Muslims. So this latter tradition would be something where Al-Biruni is standing in line with, or he, uh, this is somewhat uh, of his, you know, to speak slightly of his scholarly pedigree. Now, the book under discussion today is Biruni's India, uh, or as it is, uh, or as, as its full name goes, the book investigating what pertains to India whether rationally acceptable or despicable, but it's of course popularly known as the Book of India, or Kitab al-Hind. Uh, as I mentioned, it still represents one of the most informative and detailed accounts of medieval India. We'll look at briefly a few structural points about the book, how it's organized. Uh, the preface and the introduction contain almost exclusively ethnographic or religious data, but most of the book, roughly 48 out of the 70 chapters, they set forth a review of the achievements of Indian science in several fields, such as grammar, metrology, uh, crestometry, uh, and an and older form of chemistry, you could say, uh, astrology, astronomy, cosmology, cosmography, chronology, and of course, mathematics. So you can see that there's uh, a deep engagement because Al-Biruni was a scientist himself and had a uh, particular interest in various scientific fields. Uh, so this formed a vast chunk of his book. But the book is... Uh, punctuated, as it were, uh, with, this, with the beginning and the ending uh, with certain theological and philosophical themes. So this whole discussion on, on Indian science is at the, at the middle, 
And the book begins with certain philosophical or the theological description, and it ends with the description of certain religious practices and rituals. Uh, and this schema, again, it, for someone who might be aware, is something which is also found in, for example, if you consider uh, uh, other Muslim religious literature of uh, medieval times, this is a typical schema of the, the intention is to uh, study this foreign tradition for him with uh, as much objectivity as he can. His structure nonetheless betrays some of his own positionality and some of his background. So this is an important point which we might uh, discuss further later. Now, we're looking at Albino's uh, method and there are a few points or a few aspects of his of, of his method, which I would like to highlight here, in you know, which I which I've tried to extract in these different headings. So the, number one, we can talk about is epistemic openness. Uh, what I mean by this is that uh, epistemic or intellectual openness, uh, the uh, uh, openness to receiving knowledge wherever it comes from. Rosenthal, Frank, Franz Rosenthal, writes uh, in his essay on Al Biruni that. It must be admitted that Biruni's views of the meaning of knowledge and scholarship were eclectic in origin. He was wide open to all the influences alive in his cultural environment and ready to accept whatever was, as he phrased it, best and most correct. He thus noticed many things which his fellow scholars and scientists in his time and place and before him and after him failed to see and to utilize. While eclecticism in matters philosophical may be offensive to pedantic minds, in Biruni's case, it managed to take on the form of a system and resulted in an overall view of intellectual endeavor, which has retained to this day the stirring ring of truth. Now, I mean, this is one of the uh, key theme, key themes or the, or, the, or the key features of his method, which come, which, uh, you know, you begin to notice early on when you uh, read his introduction and you read his uh, initial chapters of, of the Book of India. Uh, but this is again something not unique to uh, to uh, Al Biruni because uh, this is part of a larger uh, intellectual orientation, you could say, among Muslim uh, medieval scholarship, uh, which can be traced back, in fact, to a hadith or a saying of the Prophet Muhammad, where uh, he said that wisdom or the wise word is a lost property of the believer. Wherever they find it, they are most deserving of it, or they claim it, they lay claim to it. Uh, again, most popularly, popularly, this was also uh, a principle upheld by Al-Kindi, Al uh, one of the earliest Muslim philosophers to translate uh, uh, some of ancient Greek philosophy into Arabic as well. So we, you find him saying that we ought not to be embarrassed of appreciating the truth and of obtaining it wherever it comes from, even if it comes from races distant and nations different from us. Nothing should be dearer to the seeker of truth than the truth itself. So this is the key feature of uh, Al Biruni's method. <clears throat> now, the second point which one notices is his impartiality, or at least his attempt at being impartial. Uh, Al Biruni writes uh, in the initial few pages of his book: "This book is not a book of argumentation and disputation." Rather, it is to be used by those who wish to dispute their antagonist and refute. Oh, sorry, it is not meant to be used by those who wish to di dispute their antagonist and refute them on matters of deviance or falsity versus the truth. It is not meant for this. Instead, this book is an account in which I present the words of the Indians on their face value. I also add similarities which can be found between them and the Greeks in order to demonstrate the closeness between them. So, if uh, Al Biruni had this uh, comparative method, which you which you'll see as you read a few pages of his book, uh, where he uh, quotes or where he discusses similar themes, if he finds in, because of, from his knowledge of ancient Greek philosophy, uh, various traditions in uh, in Muslim uh, schools of thought, which are similar to what he's discussing about uh, various Indian traditions. Uh, this was part of his comparative method. And the point of his uh, cross-referencing or comparing, again, is very clear. I mean, he's, he's, he's very clear about this. The, the intention of comparison is not to show one super, one's superiority or the other, but to uh, elucidate the point better by showing 
by uh, putting it putting it in terms which people are already, might already be familiar with in other contexts. So this impartiality is also what what gives it gives his book uh, one of its uniqueness uh, because he mentions this early on that he laments that the pre-existing literature among Muslim scholarship on related to uh, India, uh, whatever was available for Al-Biruni himself, was something which he found uh, to be of really poor quality. Uh, everything which exists on this subject, Al-Biruni says, in our literature is second-hand information, which one has copied from the other. A farrago of materials never sifted by the sieve of critical examination. So we're beginning to see that Al-Biruni is in fact very scathing and very critical about uh, his own community as, as well, uh, and perhaps more so as we will discover. Now, another point which we may decipher, or which, which we may discern in Al-Biruni's method is his reflexivity and positionality. Although these are modern terms, these are ideas which uh, one can trace or one can definitely see himself in his uh, approach. Uh, reflexivity is, is simply uh, his level of self-awareness uh, and positionality refers to the uh, um, the where you're coming from and how that may influence what you are studying or the object of your study and how you will and how you tend to perceive them. So to be self-aware of this uh, is, is something. This self-awareness one discerns in one of in uh, at the beginning of chapter eight in his India, in his book on India. Uh, he says that the subject of this chapter is very difficult to study and understand accurately since we Muslims look at it from without. Now, this realization that as an outsider, uh, no matter how much you may try to understand or decipher another or a foreign religious tradition which you do not belong to, although you may learn the language, for example, uh, Al-Biruni, by the, by the time he was writing his Kitab al he had already translated the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali in Arabic. Uh, published as Kitab Padanjal. Uh, and he had done, uh, he, he, he had also tra translated some tracts of Sankhya philosophy into Arabic as well, from Sanskrit to Arabic. So he is well aware, or uh, he is a uh, prolific student and writer uh, uh, of, uh, you know, who understands Sanskrit deeply. But he also uh, understands the limitations that he has. And some of these limitations we'll get on to towards the later part of this discussion. Uh, but this is just something to bear in mind that how your positionality as an outsider leaves much of what you're trying to understand opaque for you. Uh, it will not be as transparent as it is to an insider, someone who lives uh, by these traditions or lives within these traditions. This is something to keep in mind. Number four, moral cultivation. Now, moral cultivation in itself is a, a separate topic, but moral cultivation as a, a prerequisite, as it were, for academic study. This is something which Al-Biruni really talks about. Uh, for in, I mean, when you're tr trying to approach, uh, when you're trying to study something objectively, you need moral cultivation. He writes about this in another prominent book of his chronology of ancient nations. He writes, Higher goals can only be achieved after the purification of the worldly soul or nafs from all accidental circumstances, which ruin most people, and also from those causes which render them blind to truth, al haq What are these causes which can uh, lead you to become blind to the truth? These are ingrained customs, extreme partiality to one's own group, the asub, constant desire to be victorious over others, the zafful, following one's passions, being dominated by the intent to achieve positions of leadership and all such cravings. Al-Biruni then says, but what I have mentioned above is the most certain path which will lead you to the truth of your pursuit. If you avoid these, uh, uh, these, uh, if you try to avoid these uh, points of prejudice that may emerge within you, uh, this will be of the greatest help in removing all blemishes of suspicion and doubt in your knowledge. Otherwise, you will not achieve your desired aim, even with the most strenuous efforts. In simple terms, what we get here is that along with a clear mind, you also need a clean heart, as it were. Or along with uh, having a sharp intellect, you also need to have uh, a sympathetic approach towards the object of your study. 
or or else you will not really make any you you will not really make much progress in uh, understanding it. Now, number five, historical and ethnographic empiricism. As I mentioned at the beginning, Al-Biruni was a scientist. He was an empiricist. Uh, and uh, much of his objective uh, 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 method from science is also applied to, uh, or, or that much of that objective rigor or critical rigor is also applied to his uh, study of societies. Uh, one of these, uh, one of the different ways in which this appears is uh, at one point, Al-Biruni says something to the effect that no amount of skill in philosophical deduction or induction from the evidence of our senses can ever lead to correct notions on the religious institutions of peoples. It is only by collecting their written traditions on these matters and inquiring from the people themselves that we can form a basis for understanding. Then by comparison of the traditions and opinions of one group regarding a certain institution with the tradition and opinions of other groups, we shall bring out similarities and contrasts and gain just ideas as to relative values and the relative superiority of one system to another. Now, this is really key because uh, so something which we will perhaps touch upon towards the later part of this discussion is the method of phenomenology in modern uh, academic religious studies. Now, notice Al-Biruni's method over here. Firstly, you are collecting, uh, firstly, you are, you, you're not trying to uh, simply uh, first of all, uh, you're not relying on hearsay or secondhand reports. You're trying to see yourself. But apart from that, you're also trying to collect reports or traditions from the from the people themselves, from the people who belong to these traditions, rather than uh, from your own community or from uh, external sources. So the insider's point of view is really important for, for this method. Uh, apart, and then you have comparison of the traditions of one group with the traditions of another group, perhaps perhaps within within a broad religion or broad broad category of religion, uh, you have various groups, uh, and perhaps across religions or across cultures, we can make that comparison. Now, what happens through this comparison is eventually you get to an idea of uh, of a common theme or a common element, which may be uh, you, which you may be able to categorize or. Uh, Make a typo, uh, sorry, topology of or a grouping of based on these schema. Now, th this is again something which I'll reserve for the second part of the discussion, which we will look on, look at phenomenology in more detail. Uh, just a few more points about his uh, historical uh, ethnographic empiricism. Uh, again, he does not is not satisfied with simply taking secondhand reports and simply copying what, what other people might have written on that topic. So he's, he's trying to uh, go to the sources himself and try to uh, get the knowledge from there. Also, another last point which I mentioned here is refusing to mix the doubtful with the certain. I mean, this is a uh, you know interesting point which comes up in many places in uh, Biruni's India, where he uh, uses, uh, for example, you, you, you find him discussing uh, a certain topic, and then he comes to a point where he says that uh, we will not discuss this further because he doesn't feel himself uh, equipped with the sufficient knowledge to discuss it with due justice. So uh, he's keeping what he knows for certain uh, separate uh, from what he is unsure about. Again, this, is a, this again adds to the method of uh, you know his approach of intellectual humility on his part. Now, critical rigor again is a part of this. is an extension of this. Um, on this, we can look at his, uh, you know, examination of testimony and evidence. For example, when you're collecting reports from various societies and various traditions, uh, you have to critically filter the, these reports. Um, some writers, I mean, he he says that some of the problems with the evidence can come up. Uh, some of the causes for uh, faulty evidence can he uh, can be listed as follows. Number one, some writers are satisfied with superficial information, so they don't go in depth uh, into, or they don't analyze certain things more deeply. Uh, number two, some reporters may harbor animosities and antipathies based on national pride or personal predilections. Number three, false evidence may have, uh, appear due to altering or embellishing certain things. Uh, and number four, out of ignorance, People can confuse speculation with fact, and people mix speculation with facts. Now, 
One more aspect, an important aspect of Albinoni's method is deference to difference, or what we can say, respect for difference. Uh, this is a point which I bring up in the essay slightly, but this is the more this is the complete quote from Wilhelm Hofas, who was a prominent uh, German scholar of Indology of the late uh, 20th century. Uh, in his classic book India and Europe, uh, he writes about this uh, this feature of Albinoni's method. He says, a clear awareness of his own religious horizon as a particular context of thought led him to perceive the otherness of the Indian religious philosophical context and horizon with a remarkable clarity. Unparall this clarity was unparalleled in the world of classical antiquity with its attitudes towards the barbarians and the Orient. Albiruni did not possess the amorphous openness of syncretism and the search for common denominators. This is key. I mean, we'll perhaps uh, unpack what this means. So that is why he could comprehend and appreciate the other, the foreign as such, thematizing and explicating in an essentially new manner the problems of intercultural understanding and the challenge of objectivity when shifting from one tradition to another, from one context to another. Uh, this, is, this is a really telling and uh, uh, really, uh, uh, you know, rich reflection, uh, which we can perhaps uh, go into more detail in the Q and A about uh, how I mean, although syncretism and uh, you know trying to look for commonality among various traditions, various religious traditions in this case, uh, might be well intentioned uh, because you, uh, it has the objective of uh, you know trying to unite people essentially. But in that uh, uh, objective of uni uniting people or you know trying to bring bring them together. Uh, you may inadvertently be actually uh, suppressing certain traditions in the name of an, an imagined, uh, however accurate, uh, idea of what these traditions appear to be, or you know, appear to mean, or what the essence of these traditions is. So, for example, if you talk about a universal religion, uh, uh, I mean, again, uh, we are perhaps getting into topics which we will be discussing to us the uh, later part of this presentation. So I'll keep them uh, in abeyance for now, and we'll perhaps uh, tackle them more directly later on. But again, this is a part of Albinoni's method, uh, respect for difference, which is an important part of this method because uh, where uh, it is, I mean, again, for interfaith, for an interfaith setting, it's important to acknowledge and to uh, understand deeply the causes for difference for you know, at, at you know uh, whatever level they may be cultural or theological or philosophical differences uh, uh, it's important to understand those differences because the the point should not be to look past differences but to look through differences this is the difference uh, that can emerge over you now uh, a few more uh, aspects of the biruni's uh, method religion in science, or the relationship between religion and science that you find in him, uh, or I mean, science in terms of physical science, or in science in terms of knowledge in general. So, Albiruni has, first of all, no qualms in narrating what may be heresy as a Muslim. In fact, he uh, says this in many places that people may indict him for saying things which are uh, contrary to a you know orthodox Muslim's beliefs. Uh, but he mentions that while these may not be his beliefs, his intention or his objective in is to represent uh, these traditions as, the, as those who belong to it uh, see themselves. So in, in, in his quest for objectivity, uh, he is keen not to bring his own personal beliefs uh, uh, into it or mix them into it so that uh, it will uh, lead to a... So, so, so that I mean, these things would distort the understanding, or uh, would uh, yeah, damper the understanding uh, that, of, of, in, in, a, in an objective manner, that you're trying to gain uh, over here. In fact, if you might have uh, read the essay, uh, this is something I also bring up in the essay that for Albiruni, intellectual justice is really important, uh, which means that. Even if it is something which is unfavorable to you, you have to accept it. If if this if it is what where the conclusion or where the knowledge leads you, uh, 
so this is in fact he for al biruni this is it, it comes in the very beginning of his uh, book of india I, i suppose in the introduction itself where he grounds this as a as a scriptural imperative it is a command that emerges or originates from scripture itself he says it has been said in the quran speak the truth even if it were against yourselves and the messiah i jesus christ expresses himself in the gospel to this effect do not mind the fury of kings in speaking the truth before them they only possess your body but they have no power over your soul <clears throat> so uh oh, coming to some of uh albiruni's um you know some of the features about his relationship to science uh, more properly uh, at one place in his book on india Biruni explicitly comments that belief in the text of the Quran does not lead to absurd science because the Quran does not take explicit positions on the configurations of the heavens or provide a detailed historical chronology that could be contra- contradicted by other reports or by independent investigation. In fact for Al-Biruni those entrusted with the care of religious matters such as timekeepers at mosques should be qualified scientists and the only way to be qualified is to learn from the experts be they, be they muslim or not. In fact, uh, 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 at one point, Al-Biruni says that all Muazzins must be scientists. I mean, uh, presumably at that time, a Muazzin's function was also to keep track of the prayer times. Uh, so you have to have knowledge uh, of these sciences. So he, he states that if the Muazzin is, interest, Muazzin is interested in deep investigation and he abstains from blind imitation, and if his temperament is akin to the science of ptolemy and archimedes and apollonius and he never puffs himself up above these names and he seeks schooling and education until he reaches this position then verily he must take up the whole of the book of elements of euclid and the middle works between it and the almagest and he must give himself over to eight treatises of it thus he came as empty as the devil but he goes away as victorious as the prophet enoch if it happens that he becomes fed up from the very first with studying what we have mentioned then let him take the shortest distance away from the work let him shorten the length of hope by giving the bow over to one who can draw it and surrendering the matter to the experts so albiruni is very clear over here if you are a muazzin if you are a a, a a person interested with religious affairs you cannot avoid uh, gaining expertise or uh, the the responsibility of getting expertise in the sciences involved over here but and um, he, he actually also mentioned in detail the uh, intellectual rigor that is involved he, he he talks about eight treatises he talks about all of these various uh, classical uh, you know ancient greek philosophers that you have to study for that but again then then he also mentions that if if you find that this is not this doesn't suit your temperament then simply give up your responsibility and leave it to the experts is what he's trying to say now before we conclude uh, some of the, the features that we talked about in biruni's book we must also situate it in its intra religious context now uh, why is this important it's important because you find as i mentioned firstly al biruni uh, came to this book after having translated the yoga sutras of patanjali and some parts of sankhya philosophy so this is something he had already engaged in intellectually now what we find in his kitab al hind or the descriptions uh, or his you know theological discussions in this book of india is that he has a certain preference for these schools over other schools so for example for, he has a certain preference clearly for the yoga sutras over for example schools such as advaita why may that be so one of the reasons is that albiruni saw in the yoga sutras of patanjali a text he translated from sanskrit to arabic and uh, before the composition of india he saw in this book a harmony and unison between the soul and matter purusha and prakriti why is this important albiruni is writing in a context uh, dominated by uh, aristotelian philosophy uh, and particularly uh, as it was received in uh, muslim uh, intellectual circles Now, this feature of patanjali's yoga allowed albiruni to present a cosmological alternative to the dualistic psychology of his contemporary and philosophical adversary ibn sina avicenna who in his famous text the cure kitab ash-shifa had argued that the soul and the body are not one essence so what you see here is that 
rather than directly uh, you know going against the philosophical orthodoxy as it were uh, of of those times of the uh, Aristotelian tradition uh, in terms of the dualism of the soul and the matter, Biruni is trying is is making a lateral intervention over here by uh, taking that that position uh, through the uh, name or through the way of the yoga philosophy of Patanjali. This is an important point to keep in mind. Now, we've looked at some of the uh, intellectual merits in terms of the uh, method for interfaith dialogue. There are also various limits that we need to keep in mind or that we need to be aware of uh, when we read Albrunus India. Uh, some of these limits, again, are something which Albrunus himself acknowledges in, in various places in the book. Uh, he talks about, again, uh, the limited source material. Uh, again, the source material which was limited to him at that point, which uh, was much more limited than what we have today and I mean, what we have access to today because of the internet, because of various academic uh, studies on this matter. So this is one glaring limitation of the book and the book's depiction uh, of these various schools. Uh, but then Albiruni specifically talks about the difficulty of, of the foreign language, of a foreign language, and particularly of Sanskrit. Although he learns Sanskrit enough to be able to translate into Arabic, uh, he does write in detail about the difficulties of the challenges he has faced with the language. Uh, I mean, just in terms of articulation, it's a different language compared to Arabic. Uh, uh, just in terms of, uh, also, uh, apart from this, he also faced the, uh, the double problem of prohibitive access i.e. when he wanted to study something, he didn't find uh, people favorable enough to teach him, or uh, he didn't find himself welcome in certain circles, certain intellectual circles where he wanted to learn. Uh, uh, why this was the case, uh, Albiruni, in, in fact, also mentions this in, in one place in the book, uh, where, again, in in one of his criticisms of Mahmoud of Ghazni, is also that because of Mahmoud of Ghazni's behavior, you had all these uh, indigenous group, uh, societies or people retreating uh, further away from the, you know, uh, encroaching uh, armies or the encroaching camps. And so Al-Biruni found it even more uh, inaccessible for himself from an intellectual scholarly point of view to gain knowledge of these traditions because firstly people were going further away from it and then those who were there were also uh, not welcoming because of the context in which this was happening. Uh, apart from that, the, he also had limited access because uh, I mean, he mentions this uh, uh, as well explicitly that he was treated as an outsider, obviously, uh, as a Mlekka, as a Yavana, uh, as a foreigner, and therefore certain things were not imparted to him, certain things. Certain, certain things he, he was not uh, welcomed in certain intellectual you know, discussions. And then there's the, also the, the uh, issue of textual corruption. So uh, Albiruni himself is acquiring a lot of this information through various reports which are coming to him. But these reports of these traditions, these narratives, may themselves be uh, problematic in terms of how they have been, they've been preserved, in terms of the translations, in terms of the spelling mistakes, which leads to a different uh, meaning emerging over there. So these are things that, which he himself is uh, open about and uh, aware of that these are the limitations of this book. There's certain other limitations with which Al-Biruni uh, is not as aware of. Again, I mean, we are aware of these things from the hindsight of a thousand years. Uh, but Al-Biruni, uh, at that point, was clearly not, not aware of this because he was positioned as he was in this context. Uh, number one, one of the limitations, again, which I want to talk about here in more detail is essentialism i.e. Uh, essentializing a certain religion or saying that, you know, this is all that the religion is or this is the main thing about a certain religion, to put it in simple terms. Uh, in, so in Al-Biruni, although he, he doesn't coin the term Hinduism, uh, he Hinduism still emerges as a unitary and mon monolithic entity. Uh, and he, he, he's also very explicit about this. He says in one place, before entering on our exposition, we must form an adequate idea of that which renders it so particularly difficult to penetrate the essential nature of any Indian subject. So the 
quest for the essential nature is clearly his objective. Also, in this quest for essentializing something, uh, he has identified certain facets as being more central to it rather than others. For, and for him, uh, according to him, the distinguishing emblem, al-alam, of the Hindu tradition was the doctrine of metempsychosis, tanaso, or as it is commonly known, rebirth, the doctrine of rebirth. Uh, Al-Biruni writes, just as the declaration of the article of faith, the kalima is the emblem of Muslim belief, Trinitarianism is the sign of Christianity and the institution of the Sabbath or that of Judaism. So is metempsychosis, i.e. rebirth, the banner of the Indian religion, al-Nihla and Hindiya, such that he who does not profess it does not belong to it and is not considered to be a member. Now, again, this is very clearly for uh, almost every one of us aware. Uh, this is uh, a stark idiosyncrasy in his account uh, and does not represent the tradition as it is. Uh, this is again part of the essentializing uh, nature of his project. And it's also part of, uh, 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 again, perhaps due to limited resources, limited access. Uh, there, are, there are certain details which are unreliable in the book. Again, we are, we are more interested in the, in the method. And so uh, the method rather than the details, and even in the method itself, the, the method, the, the aspect of essentialism or essentializing is, is, a, is a problematic one, as we will see further on. Um, number two, textualism. Now, Albironi is a scholar, is a, is a prolific uh, scholar, uh, who's written various uh, treatises uh, on, I mean, for example, if you just consider his Kitab al Hind, uh, almost a thousand page uh, book at the time on uh, a, you know, a, path-breaking book into a new territory. Uh, but he was, uh, being a scholar or you know, you know, being intellectually situated in those times, we, we find the, the aspect of textualism being central to him, i.e. texts are given more credibility over other ways of knowledge. For example, folk practices or local practices. Uh, these would be discounted compared to the textual uh, narrative of a certain event, but the, the textual narrative of how, uh, of what Hindu religious, social religious traditions mean. And so, of course, similarly, there's also a downplaying of magic, myth, and such rituals. <clears throat> Another limitation is of value judgments. Now, Al Biruni himself wants to be as free from value judgments as possible. Again, uh, we, we saw in the beginning that. Uh, he, he he's very clear about this that certain Muslims might indict him of being, you know, of on on uh, uh, risky grounds because uh, he is presenting all these beliefs which, which, from a traditional Muslim point of view, might be problematic. Uh, but his intention always was to present them without value, without without allowing his own beliefs to influence the presentation or uh, the uh, uh, portrayal. But we find that for all his disclaimers about neither endorsing nor refuting his object of study, Al-Biruni was more than forthcoming in passing his evaluation on the soundness of Hindu thought. In their doctrinal orientation, he saw the Hindus as closest to the Greeks, as uh, the scholar Ainsley Embre pointed out. In among the most remarkable moments in, in his text, Al-Biruni called Hinduism not the truth, which for him meant not monotheistic, but only a deviation from the truth. In Al-Biruni's own words, all heathenism, whether Greek or Indian, is in its pith and marrow one and the same belief, because it is only a deviation from the truth. <clears throat> now, one final uh, point which uh, we, we can... Uh, uh, one of the final limitations which we can, we can discuss for now is the, uh, the uh, strain of elitism which we find in, in Al-Biruni's work. So Al-Biruni separated human beings of all cultural backgrounds into two groups, one that understood and one that did not, or one that is literate and the other illiterate, the elite and the masses, the awam and the khawas. These are constantly counterposed to each other. He says, the belief of educated and uneducated people differs in every community. Okay, so this is not just about uh, Hindu uh, societies that he's uh, studying, but he uh, says that this applies to every community. For the, the former, i.e. the educated, strive to conceive abstract ideas and to define general principles, 
whilst the latter do not pass beyond the apprehension of the senses and are content with the derived rules. Again, he also says, it is well known that the popular mind leans towards the sensible world and has an aversion to the world of abstract thought, which is only understood by highly educated people, of whom in every time and every place, there are only few. So these educated philosophers are only few in every time, and they understand the reality, or they understand the, uh, you know, the abstract level truths, or the higher level truths of, of a religion, or uh, any tradition, rather than the uh, uneducated masses. Uh, interestingly, he also gives the example of Socrates in uh, making this point. The Socrates was a single figure or, or uh, was a minority, uh, and he opposed the majority and they opposed the crowd of his nation uh, and again suffered the consequences for doing that. Now, the, the problem with this, again, is uh, at one place, although this distinction between the uh, elite and the masses is applied uh, across uh, various uh, kinds of you know, rituals and uh, social religious practices that he's discussing. But at one point, uh, this is also applied in the, in the discussion on idolatry or image worship. Now again, idolatry is a problematic term because it, it already has certain value judgments uh, laid in within it. So image worship is a more neutral term, but in Al-Biruni's book, uh, there is a discussion on idolatry in his terms. So. Uh, in this context, he says that the educated among the Hindu society or the uh, of his time of the, the the society which he was studying, the educated do not indulge in uh, these image worship practices as much as the uh, common people do who are uneducated. According to him, uh, I mean these are the I mean uh, according to him this this distinction uh, applies in this. Um, uh, in this uh, domain. But of course, uh, this is a highly problematic classification or typology because uh, the case of someone, uh, of a scholar such as Shankaracharya uh, is a stark uh, you know, contradiction to this kind of need classification because Shankaracharya, although he was an Advaitin, uh, uh, someone who, uh, who, who was a non-dualist, uh, in fact, he was, he was also against, uh, in, in one sense, against certain theistic representations of God or overly theistic representation of God. Uh, I mean, in, in, uh, in his philosophy of the Nirguna Brahman, the, the Brahman beyond qualities, the transcendent uh, reality. So in, in, even though Shankaracharya is at, at the level of Paul or at the level of his philosophy uh, is such an iconoclast, in his practice and in his ritual behavior and in his uh, ritual life, religious life, uh, he engaged in uh, many of these practices, which Al-Biruni would consider not belonging to, uh, not being fit for an intellectually, uh, you know, an, an intellectual or an elite uh, class of society. So these are certain idiosyncrasies which are there in this book. Uh, Again, now, one must also keep in mind, to be fair to Al-Biruni, that this is a hierarchy which is prominent, this, this hierarchy between the elite and the masses. This is not just unique to him, but it is because he's writing in a wider, he's writing in a wider intellectual context. So he's deriving also all, all of these things predominantly from ancient Greek philosophy and medieval Muslim philosophy, where, uh, and where this distinction between, between two classes of societies was maintained intellectually, that there are, you have intellectuals on the one hand and you have masses on the other hand. Uh, you have people who understand philosophy on the one hand and you have people who don't understand philosophy. Uh, and uh, this elitism was also applied to uh, Muslim Muslims as well, Muslim societies as well. Uh, and perhaps uh, much more uh, scathingly uh, in some places that uh, we don't necessarily have to get into right now. <clears throat> so. Uh, here we come to a uh, break, as it were, in our discussion, because we have we've been looking uh, at Al-Biruni's uh, method of, uh, uh, you know, studying uh, religion, uh, and you know, of you know, cross-cultural or cross cross-religious studies, uh, and we've been trying to ex extract or see, uh, you know, derive some interfaith pointers from from that.
uh, we will get to the, the second half of this uh, discussion on, you know, uh, for, for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes of our discussion, we will also be looking at uh, how, also try to situate all this discussion in the context of modern religious studies. So before we begin that, I'd like to pause over here and I'd, I'd like to entertain any, any discussion or any comments so far. So you're open to, for I mean, we're open for questions or for comments or uh, what do you feel so far about uh, what we've discussed? Uh, I'm going to just uh, start uh, before uh, others do. And I have a couple of things that come to my mind. One is uh, that, um, uh, one, one is that you mentioned that the folk practices, et cetera, you know, were not as uh, documented as, uh, uh, as, as let's say the, uh, the, the scriptures so um you know like in 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 the current situation we would say that you know the he, he focused more on the vedic hinduism rather than the tantric hinduism which is which is more uh folk practices and magic etc so what was so my question would be like what was the reason for that that you know he missed out on that part and uh, second uh i also want to know if his book was you know if his writings was sort of read at that point, and if that had an impact, at, you know, at in during the time when they were written, uh, what was the impact, and how were they taken at that point? So these are two things, and then I think others can probably also ask if they have something. Right. Uh, so I'll just take this briefly uh, because uh, uh, I don't uh, uh, I don't want to pretend to be a scholar of I'll be running. Um, this is something uh, which he mentioned that at one place on chapter 23 in the book of India. Uh, so he says that the, the main and most essential point of the Hindu world of thought is that which the Brahmins think and believe. For they are specially trained for preserving and maintaining their religion. And this it is which we shall explain, i.e. the belief of the Brahmins. So, uh, I mean, clearly uh, that is uh, his you know, uh, explicit approach. Uh, uh, why uh, that might be the case uh, is a more complex question. I mean, it's, it's a more complex from a sociological point of view. Uh, why this is the case, and that you know people in that society tended to, uh, or you know, I mean, belonging to the particular. Uh, intellectual uh, lineage that, that he belonged to, why that approach emerges. So that's a much more complex question. The the other question was, sorry, uh, about... About like, uh, how were his uh, writings taken at that point? Uh, in time right. right. Um, this is again much, much more, uh, uh, you know, really uh, complex question. Uh, but there are writings on this. Uh, I mean, one I mean, one of those books is uh, this one, which I initially mentioned by uh, George Malagares. Uh, his final chapter is on the reception of Albiruni uh, and how he was received in those times and in medieval times and in modernity. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons, well, it seems that virtually, I mean, I mean at least his method of interfaith understanding, interreligious understanding, is something which was. Uh, almost uh, uh, neglected for a long time after his writing. So it seems that he didn't receive as much as much of a following as he could have. Uh, there, there may be different reasons for this. One, maybe, I mean, part of the reason, I mean, that George Malagaris also mentions is that uh, Albumini was very, uh, you know, forthcoming about his own personal beliefs and about his own, I mean, as, as an independent thinker. So uh, he was unapologetic about his about his beliefs and about uh, he was uh, unconcerned about upsetting anyone uh, or about being politically correct uh, to to an extent that uh, this causes him to uh, be uh, unfavorable or uh, in 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 various circles. For example, in in uh, religious circles, uh, because he is talking about you know uh, things which are theologically problematic for religious people. Uh, and then uh, also in philosophical circles, like those of Ibn Sina, etc., 
because he's also going against the philosophical orthodoxy, which we mentioned in the beginning, you know, during our discussion, uh, the uh, Aristotelian uh, uh, cosmology or the Aristotelian philosophy that was a part of, uh, that was uh, predominant at the time. And Al-Biruni's main reason for opposing this was his empirical uh, grounding in science. So he was challenging the uh, Aristotelian orthodoxy in, in uh, Muslim philosophy uh, based on his empirical observations. And this was again not acceptable uh, in, in those circles. So, I mean, these could be some of the reasons why uh, he uh, went into neglect uh, and was later revived. But it seems that uh, his, uh, I mean, th th there's no school of Al Biruni or, I mean, school of thought which, are, which emerged around Al Biruni in that sense. So. Okay. Uh, Puna, Munir, Saida, Vitra, or Sonal, do you have any questions or comments? If, if there's something that you noticed that stood out for you, or is there something that uh, you would like to, uh, something that intrigued you, you want to ask? Uh, please feel free to unmute and ask. We're a cozy group today, so don't need uh, the hand raising method. So. Or I mean, if, if, there's, if there's no question, uh, is it uh, are you are you able to follow it, or are you able to? Uh, because uh, there were extensive quotations in my uh, presentation. I don't know if that's a method you prefer, or if you prefer uh, having less quotations. I think this is a different topic, so we do need uh, probably uh, the quote because it, it's also about the book and uh, the writing, so it's important okay. to have. Yeah. yeah. Anybody? <laughs> or we can maybe after you do the second part, we can come back. Right. To the sure. Sure. Of course. Yeah. So, but uh, I, I just want a uh, you know a head nod or a thumbs up that you know you're able to follow what what we've been discussing. Okay, sure, right. Uh, because uh, based on that, I'll, I'll either try to uh, limit some of what I'm going to say in the following, uh, because uh, we again also have some more, uh, you know, it's also quotation extensive. Uh, so if you want me to, uh, if, you, if you feel at any point that this is, uh, uh, if, if you're not following anything, uh, let me know, or if I'm going too fast, uh, let me know. and. I'll, I'll go slow or I'll repeat something. Okay, okay so uh, we'll be looking at uh, Al Biruni's, uh, you know, method in approaching or in the in the study of religion. Uh, in the article which you may have read, which I had uh, shared uh, in advance to the meeting, uh, I do mention phenomenology in one or two places, but I don't go into detail into the method. So here we, we can flesh out some of the details of the phenomenological method. Uh, so the, or, or what can be termed the phenomenological movement in modern religious studies uh, and in modern philosophy. So I mean, these, uh, the, the three photos you see in front of you are the three key thinkers in modern, uh, in the school of phenomenology, which emerged in uh, 19th, 20th centuries, uh, sorry, 20th and 21st centuries. Uh, number one, the first figure is Edmund Husserl, the, the person who's considered the father of phenomenology, even though the term was coined before him. Uh, second one is Martin Heidegger, and the third one is uh, Merleau Ponty. Now, we don't have to go into detail into what these uh, fig figures represent for us. As we'll see, we are more interested in the uh, in the uh, aspect of this method as it is applied in modern religious studies. So, not in philosophy as such. Uh, but in, in its application in modern religious studies. That's what we're looking at. So uh, there are various academic approaches to stu study religion. Uh, you might be aware of many of these. History of religion, you can have a sociology of religion, anthropology of religion, psychology of religion, philosophy of religion. Uh, and I mean, most of us have, have some idea of what all these different methods mean. And, how they are different from each other. But what is this thing known as the, what we can call the phenomenology of religion? Now, we'll look at what it means exactly, but let's see that, you know, it's important to point out that phenomenology appear 
uh, appears or emerges as a separate method within religious studies. Now, religious religious studies uh, itself is a separate is a, is a broad science within which phenomenology is one of the ways of looking at religion. And it is uh, it was uh, or it, I mean uh, historically it has been a, a very influential way of uh, looking at religion uh, in the past hundred years. So. Uh, this, uh, this method, this approach emerges in reaction to, number one, apologetic studies. So studies which, or you know, comparative religious studies which were apolog of an apologetic nature or the polemical nature, or trying to prove the superiority of one religious tradition over another, or that were ethnocentric, you know, focused on a certain ethnicity or a certain religious uh, group to the exclusion of others, or triumphalist, or social Darwinian. I.e., I mean, for example, uh, of you know where in in this scenario you would conceive of religion as uh, of the of the various world religions as being on a certain evolutionary ladder, uh, and you have the primitive religions on the lower part, rung of the ladder, and as you go up the ladder as human society evolves and matures, you have the more developed religions according to this, uh, where you know typically it would that developed religion would be Western Christianity or even after that. It would be uh, scientific atheism, uh, which would represent the culmination of this evolution of uh, man and humankind. So this is again this social Darwinian perspective is something which was uh, which uh, modern phenomenology of religion was developing in opposition to. Also, it was in reaction to normative approaches, i.e., those approaches which are, which are trying to which for which for whom the main question was whether this is right or wrong, true or false. Uh, from a theological point of view. So, I mean, this was not the objective of, the, of, the, of phenomenology. It was to understand the uh, these traditions as they are, or as the those who belong to it understand it, or in their self-perception, how these traditions are understood. Again, this was also in reaction to uh, reductionistic traditions. Psychological reductionism or sociological reductionism, uh, i.e., for example, a psychological reductionism would be to say that, uh, you know, to explain away religious behaviors, I mean, explaining them is, is one thing, explaining them away is another thing. To explain away religious behaviors, saying that, you know, uh, the, the reason why people behave this way or, you know, someone's behaving this way is actually has to do with an underlying psychological reason behind it. And it is nothing more than that. To say that it has a psychological reason is to add a point. To say that it is nothing more than that is to subtract everything else apart from it. So this is what is involved in reductionism, to say that this is all it is. It is nothing beyond that. It is nothing beyond psychological uh, you know, uh, uh, factors or psychological forces acting, acting themselves out. Similarly, you can have a sociological reduction. You can explain away uh, religious behavior in society by saying that this is because of these sociological reasons. Uh, but, but in fact, if you look at anyone's own religious identity or anyone, anyone's own uh, religiosity in their own lives, uh, very few people would actually say that uh, the reason they uh, uh, belong to or they uh, believe certain ideas or certain beliefs, hold certain beliefs, is because of these uh, psychological conditioning or because of this sociological conditioning. Uh, so, I mean, if you have this reductionistic approach, you are leaving no room for free will on the one hand and for autonomy or human choice on the other. So. Uh, so it is against these uh, reductionistic approaches as well that phenomenology of religion emerges. Now, uh, we won't get into detail over here, I'll just talk about this broadly. There are two kinds of phenomenological studies that we can talk about. There is a non-philosophical phenomenology and a philosophical phenomenology. What this means is the first, uh, the, the first part, the first method uh, is a more wider uh, approach where you can study anything from a phenomenological perspective, i.e., it is a method of you know uh, uh, describing and studying something systematically, comparatively. For example, if you're studying religions, so scholars would assemble groups of religions, religious religious phenomena, uh, as it's found in various traditions, and put them together and see how what uh, emerges about their major aspects and their typologies and how you can classify or categorize them. So this is the non-philosophical phenomenology. To say that this is non-philosophical is only to say that it doesn't belong to a particular school, uh, particular philosophical tradition or, or school of thought. 
which we will see the latter groups belong to. For example, the, the, some of these latter groups, again, are con concerned with certain other, certain specific themes. And most of these are not concerned directly with the question of religion. Uh, these are concerned with the nature of consciousness, the conditions of consciousness. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the three figures we saw in the beginning, Edmund Husserl, for him, uh, transcendental phenomen phenomenology uh, becomes a school, uh, becomes <clears throat> a, a different kind of uh, intellectual enterprise. Existential phenomenology in the case of John Paul Sartre and Mulu Ponty, hermeneutic philosophy in Martin Heidegger, Paul Rico. So this is a separate school of thought, or <clears throat> excuse me, these are uh, separate um, schools or uh, certain separate schools within uh, certain uh, philosophical traditions, which are focused on certain specific questions within philosophy. So uh, most of these, as I mentioned, are not directly dealing with religion. Uh, but phenomenology of religion is an approach which develops in modern religious studies, uh, and, but it derives much of these, much of uh, the, the spirit, much of the phenomenological spirit from these founding uh, figures or these founding thinkers. So that is what we are concerned with, really. But there are still some things about the phenomenological method in general, uh, which are which we can point out. <clears throat> So number one, uh, in this method, uh, number one, the, the first point is the descriptive nature of this method. Phenomenology aims to be a rigorous descriptive science or discipline or approach. The slogan here, the famous slogan by Husserl <clears throat> is to the things themselves, back to the things themselves. So this expresses the determination to turn away from philosophical theories and concepts toward the direct intuition and description of phenomena as they appear in immediate experience. So the idea here is to keep your, uh, is to attempt or try to keep your philosophical prejudices or your biases or your preconceptions away from, uh, or you know, out of the picture uh, and out of this, uh, uh, you know, out of your approach to a certain object and to just uh, go to the thing itself and see what it, what it, what it has to uh, teach you. So, that's the, that's one point. The other point is anti-reductionism, as we talked about. You know, against trying to reduce things into any kind of you know, uh, psychological reduction, sociological reduction, all of these things. Uh, so this is something uh, this method is against. Number thing, <clears throat> number three, bracketing. Now, bracketing is the is the key is, is one of the key terms of this method, also known as epoche in Greek, uh, which refers to abstention or suspension of judgment. So what, what this means is, uh, again, what we talked about is bracketing out or, you know, bracketing means uh, keeping your preconceptions at one side for, for the moment and just studying uh, something or, you know, trying to study something as it is or as it presents itself to you rather than letting your categories or your mental or conceptual categories uh, influence how you categorize those things or how you uh, uh, fit them into your on you know mental schema or reality, so uh, so try to keeping um, keeping your theoretical presuppositions uh, out of the picture as much as possible. Now, uh, most although some phenomenologists uh, try to posture themselves as being completely completely presuppositionless, most phenomenologists, however, uh, have interpreted bracketing as a goal of freeing the phenomenologists from unexamined presuppositions or at least of rendering explicit. Even if you have presuppositions, which everyone is bound to have, I mean, owing to everyone's positionality, or you know where you're coming from, the point would be here to render them explicit, to be self-aware and reflective about this and to make it apparent uh, what your presuppositions are and clarify such presuppositions rather than completely deny their existence. Number four, idea equation. Now, uh, eidos in Greek means essences. As I uh, now, the, the, one of the key the key uh, aspects of the phenomenological method is the intuition of universal essences, uh, which is akin to Plato's forms. If you're familiar with that idea, uh, the the central aim of the phenomenological method in this way, in this sense, is to disclose the essential structure embodied in the particular data. 
So what, what this involves is uh, the phenomena, the various uh, phenomena that you're encountering are subjected to a process of free variation, which means that you take uh, all the different kinds of those phenomena that you find and you put them together and you see what uh, what is essential and what is accidental to it. Uh, and through this, you, you, you try to get a sense of what the essence of that phenomena is. I mean, let me give you an example of this. Uh, if you can see, there's a pen I'm holding over here. Uh, what makes this pen a pen is a question. Or sorry, what is, or in, in other words, uh, what is uh, the essence of being a pen, right? Or what makes this pen a pen or what is the essence of being a pen, which you can then apply to anything and say that this is a pen. So is the fact that it, it has black ink rather than blue ink, the fact, the, the, the point which makes it a pen. Uh, if you compare it with another pen, uh, which I have here as a, being a red pen, uh, clearly the ink is not essential to the essence of being a pen, or the ink is, is not essential to being a pen. Uh, ink is, in that sense, accidental. Similarly, you, through this process, uh, you, you try to imagine, or you, you, you try to uh, not imagine, at least you, you try to uh, take all the historically uh, manifested uh, particular forms and compare them and see what is essential and what is accidental in that sense. And then through through those bracketing out, what is that, what is accidental? So for example, it need, uh, need not have been a black pen in order to be a pen, or it need not have had a cap in order to be a pen. It uh, need not have... Uh, 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 for example, a certain brand in order to be a pen. So all these things are accidental to being a pen. So the essence, again, is is uh, you come at the essence by bracketing out all that is accidental. So this is the eidetic vision which this uh, philosophical method uh, is talking about. Now, this these four principles that we talked about, these are developed in the philosophical school of phenomenology, but these, again, are also applied to the in, in modern religious studies when it comes to... Uh, the approach of you know studying religion, as we will see. So coming to phenomenology of religion, now again we'll focus on what has been called the classical religious phenomenology, the approach closely connected with the Dutch school in the first half of the 20th century, because this is where religious phenomenology had its origin and achieved its most distinctive formulation. Key figures here include people like Sean Tepe, Thiel, Christensen, Van der Leeuwen. We'll just look at two of these thinkers before we close for today. Christensen. Uh, now, we're looking at some key phenomenology, uh, phenomenologists of religion or religious phenomenologists uh, and seeing how what we, uh, uh, you know, what their method uh, is about. Now, Christensen re represents an extreme formulation of the descriptive approach within phenomenology. But remember, I, I, uh, I said initially that there are there were two different approaches. One is the descriptive approach and one is the philosophical school, which has to do more with this second aspect of which has, uh, you know, where we're talking about the eidetic vision, trying to get at the essence of something. Uh, so Christensen isn't, isn't interested in that. His main interest is in the description of uh, these, uh, of, you know, uh, various religious phenomena, uh, rather than getting at the essences in that philosophical manner, uh, which is actually uh, associated with the founder of the, uh, or, or, or the philosopher who's best known for phenomenology, Edmund Husserl. So that eidetic vision is a Husserlian uh, process or a Husserlian method. Christensen's method is different from that. Uh, again, but in his method, how it emerges is that uh, he is re rejecting traditional comparative religion. Why? Because he sees it as insufficiently scientific because it is pitched apologetically to demonstrate Christianity's superiority. And then because phenomenology favors neutral observation, in phenomenology you require a new kind of comparison, which doesn't include this superiority or triumphalist kind of presuppositions and developmental presumptions, uh, developmentalist, i.e. the Darwinian presumptions, which we already discussed. Uh, religious phenomenology's concern is not to compare the excellence of religions, but to understand why a particular thing is valued within a religion. It begins by attempting to understand religion from its own standpoint, that is, how it is understood by its own adherents. These are key terms. <clears throat> now, with along with Rudolf Otto, uh, Otto is another uh, key uh, religious phenomenologist, 
uh, whose classic book, The Idea of the Holy, uh, is uh, one of the classic uh, books in the field. Uh, so along with Otto, Christensen takes the holy uh, to as the sui generis category of religion, as the unique category of religion. I mean, if, if you were to ask the question, what is religion about? The idea, the answer from Otto and Christensen would be the holy. The religion, religion is about the holy. And what is this holy? So this is a category which is not susceptible to intellectual, ethical, or aesthetic reduction. I.e., you cannot just simply, uh, you, you cannot encapsulate it or, you know, um, exhaust it in purely intellectual or ethical or aesthetic terms. Now, for Otto, Newman or Numinous means the co concept of the holy minus its moral and rational aspects. This is important. Why? Because by emphasizing this non-moral and non-rational aspect of religion, he isolates the overplus of meaning beyond the rational and the conceptual. I.e., by saying that it is the non-moral, non-rational, you're going beyond what you would think, uh, you know, uh, about, about being religious. Uh, if you were to describe being religious as being something beyond being simply moral and being being simply rational, what is that beyond? It is uh, something that you're, you're, you're trying to capture by this idea of the holy. So this constitutes the universal essence of religious experience for Otto and for Christensen. Now, none of this is to say that other approaches to religion are useless. They are simply less than ideal. So, for example, they would say that Comparative religion fails because it valorizes one particular religion to the exclusion of others. History of religion is objectively too distant. And philosophy of religion is focused on idealities. Uh, it is focused on trying to uh, come to, um, uh, first of all, idealities in terms of uh, abstract arguments uh, rather than you know uh, actual practices or lived experiences of people. Uh, and it's also focused on questions of truth and uh, right and wrong, again, normative questions again, uh, about whether God exists or what are the proofs of God or the problem of evil and certain such questions. Uh, and doesn't get, get to the heart of the religious experience, which phenomenologists uh, would uh, argue uh, is being lost in the philosophy of religion. Now, the belief commitments smuggled into comparative religions bias its conclusions. Uh, in the comparative method, you uh, what 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 is actually what what has historically been known as a comparative method has actually been the competitive method. Uh, it was more of a co competition rather than a comparison, trying to outprove or uh, uh, one's one religious tradition over the other. So this was what was happening at the time, uh, and the objectively empathetic method of history was incapable of delivering the existential nature of religion. And therefore, it falls short of imaginative entry into religion. Uh, now, finally, phenomenology, as you uh, as it emerges, uh, tries to take a middle course between these. But again, it, it should be emphasized that phenomenology is not a separate field; it is a method within a field. So, religious study is a field, but phenomenology is a method, and as a method, it is related to the other methods within the field. So, it has mutual relations with all these fields. So, it derives. And it builds upon all of these methods, but it says that these methods in themselves are not exhaustive of what religion represents. So, for example, it says that comparative, from comparative religion, uh, religious philosophy accepts some typological categories, some classificatory schema. From history of religion, it accepts the empathetic method and historical facts. From philosophy, it accepts the definition of religion's essence. But to these gleanings, phenomenology adds the personal touch an indefinable sympathy or intuition for alien religious data that grows through scientific discovery while being grounded in our own experience of what religion is. In fact, to some extent, uh, this uh, it's, it's uh, interesting to find one remark in Christensen where, uh, in fact, he, he makes a point similar to Al-Biruni's uh, point about moral and spiritual cultivation as being a prerequisite for uh, an academic study of religion. So Christensen also says something similar where, uh, or at least hints at something similar. He says that without doubt, this whole process of uh, uh, you know being objective in your in your study or in your approach to this uh, of, to uh, religion, it only takes place by the illumination of a spirit of a superior spirit who extends above and beyond our spirit. 
So in in in, in uh, other words, it's only possible through the, through the grace of God and uh, not through uh, you know uh, your own means alone, uh, because human beings are are bound to be uh, you know human efforts are bound to be to have their own biases, their own prejudices. Uh, and so there's there's something beyond that. I mean, in, in order to rise above that, you also there's also a transcendental or a spiritual ascent that is happening within the within the researcher, within the person who's studying these things, in order to grasp them at, the, at that level. Now, the final person which we'll look at today uh, is Van der Leeuw. Uh, Van der Leeuw is he died in 1950. He represents the other. Uh, end of the spectrum, or the sorry, the, the other uh, you know kind of approach, which is typical uh, in phenomenology, which has to do with the eidetic method, which you talked about, the the method of getting to the essence of something. For example, I talked about the pen. Uh, so, how you would apply this to religion uh, is a is a different question. But this is their attempt. The attempt in Van der Leeuw is to uh, get to the heart of various religious practices or religious uh, ideas or themes in religion. Uh, through this kind of eidetic reduction uh, and trying to get at the forms of this. This is the more philosophical kind of uh, school, and this is again closer to the Husserlian uh, method. <clears throat> now, uh, for all this, phenomenology also has its critics. Uh, and there are the, some, of the, some of the valid or uh, you know, criticisms which can be made against phenomenology uh, is that despite its rejection of earlier models of positivism, it may be that phenomenology of religion has unintentionally retained some of the positivistic assumptions regarding the description of unconstrued, uninterpreted objective facts. So, for example, uh, if Al-Biruni says, I mean, I, I mean I'm, I'm just comparing Al-Biruni with modern phenomenology to make this, to uh, link all this. Uh, Al-Biruni or, or a modern phenomenologist such as, uh, when, when Husserl says to the things themselves, we want to go back to the things themselves and not let our preconceptions or our biases uh, flavor our interpretation or anyhow uh, or when you know uh, al-biruni says that he is simply trying to narrate the facts as they are this is a, a statement uh, we find in al-biruni so uh, the the idea that you can simply narrate facts as they are objective facts as they are or you can simply get objective truth from things uh, is a is a highly pro pro problematic one especially when, you're, when it's concerned with uh, things such as uh, human societies and human beings Rather than you know uh, empirical uh, science or uh, physical science, so it's it's, it's really problematic to have this uh, scientific or uh, positivistic uh, bent when you're trying to study human societies, uh, and the and, and, and to think that you can get a pure facts uh, isolated from any interpretive lens is a highly problematic assumption. Uh, even if you think that you're only quoting something or you're only uh, reproducing something as it was. Uh, a, quotation, uh, a, a quotation is already an interpretation because you are selecting a particular quote in, or uh, a particular passage to the exclusion of other passages. So within the selection itself, your interpretation has already uh, reflected itself. This we found again, if you, if you remember in the beginning when we saw Al-Biruni's structure of the Book of India. So within the structure itself, uh, a certain interpretive flavor was added to the whole discussion. So <clears throat> now, uh, again, one more problem with this method is the, the question of the, the eidetic reduction, right? The, the philosophical reduction or you know, trying to get to the form of something uh, is, an, is an unverifiable uh, uh, method, arguably. Uh, also because, you know, uh, two people can have different uh, intuitions of this eidetic reduction uh, and the, you know, uh, repeatability, as it were, of this method is uh, is not good. Now, however, I mean, regardless of all this, there is still value in uncovering religious essences and structures. But this should be done with a caveat that these structures and these essences are embodied and contextualized, and they're not fixed. They they should not be seen as fixed, absolute, a historical, eternal truths and meanings. They should be seen in the uh, wider social, social historical context uh, and embodiment. So we need uh, uh, a more uh, uh, a more 
uh, a reformed uh, phenomenology or a new rehabilitated phenomenology would look slightly different. Uh, what would be the key features of this? Uh, a more self-critical and modest phenomenology of religion can contribute much to the study of religion. It will include awareness of its presuppositions, its historical and situ contextualized situatedness, where it's coming from and how it is influencing, and what are these uh, social cultural factors influencing uh, the interpreter himself or herself, and its limited perspectival knowledge claims. But it will not completely abandon concerns about the commonality of human beings and the value of unity as well as differences. Such a self-critical and modest phenomenology of religion will attempt to formulate essential structures and meanings through rigorous phenomenological methods, including intersubjective confirmation of knowledge claims, through dialogue with the other, while also attempting to formulate new dynamic, contextually sensitive projects involving creating a creative encounter, contradiction, and synthesis. So this is what uh, a new phenomenology may look like, and this is already uh, uh, being done, uh, and people are already uh, writing and speaking about this. So the the figure over here, which we, which you saw, uh, Gavin Flood's uh, classic book now, which was written about twenty years ago, I think, uh, was a skipping critique of uh, uh, the phenomenological method in the study of religion. Uh, but Gavin Flood himself, uh, who's a senior scholar in, in Hindu studies and the study of religion, uh, himself organized uh, a uh, conference recently uh, uh, towards a di the direction of a new phenomenology or a rehabilitated phenomenology, uh, taking the uh, the method uh, and uh, trying to give it a more uh, embedded and a contextualized uh, um, uh, spin or a more contextualized, uh, trying to contextualize it and trying to uh, rid itself of, of its ahistorical and its uh, naive, socially naive uh, presumptions. Now, before we end for today, uh, there is one more thing uh, which I'd like to briefly talk about. Because we, we've been talking about religious studies and religion, uh, the category of religion itself is highly problematic. And we should speak a little bit about that. Uh, because this is not a neutral category in any way. If you just try this thought experiment yourself, uh, what do you think of when you think of the word religion? Can you think of it in a neutral sense? Or is it always a loaded term? When we think of religions, can we say that some religions are more religious than others? I think, I think we can, in fact. I mean, if you just ask yourself uh, straightforwardly without give, giving it much thought, uh, do you, what is religion? What what comes to your mind when you think of, of religion? And then, uh, based on that idea, do you think some religions are more religious than others? Uh, it, it appears to be the case. Therefore, uh, a universal religion or a universal uh, idea of religion is not an empty signifier. Uh, it cannot uh, exist in itself because uh, there can't be such a thing as a neutral universal which is unblemished by the slightest hint of a particular. I.e., you cannot imagine, for example, if, if I were to ask you to imagine a universal religion, uh, a, any imagination itself would take some or the other kind of particular form. Uh, there is no imagination without any form. Uh, I mean, when an idea enters language, it has already become particularized. A language, a thought is all, always provincial or particular. So when we use the term religion, we have already in, intended an outline to be roughly occupied by a con, conceptual contender, either Islam, Christianity, Hinduism. Again, I mean, these terms in themselves are highly problematic uh, because they presume a re, what, what we'll see is a reified or a uh, uh, rigid idea of what a religion is with, us, with certain fixed boundaries and certain fixed structure. Uh, when we talk about Islam or Hinduism or Christianity. Uh, but it, it may be highly problematic to talk of religion in those terms because socially and historically, religion has not operated in such fixed uh, uh, terms. Again, our identity of idea of identity itself, itself is reified. Uh, we tend to think of religious identity or any identity in general as being a fixed or a rigid or an uh, impermeable thing. Uh, Wilfred Campbell Smith, the scholar of religious studies, talked about this, uh, calling it the reification of religion, which means the mentally making religion into a thing 
and gradually coming to conceive it as an objective systematic entity. So this makes, you know, when you are assuming impermeable and fixed boundaries, not only across religious frontiers, but across the borders of non-religious secular activities and religion. For, for example, not, not only Islam versus Hinduism, for example, or Islam versus Christianity, for example, that these, are, these being two different, you know, uh, entirely distinct uh, uh, non-porous boundaries between them, between them uh, but also between Islam and secularism, or Hinduism and secularism, Christianity and secularism. So this, the, the category of secular itself is also uh, is is always uh, implicit in the, in the whenever we use the, the word religion. Uh, so I mean, the, the secular category includes economic, social, political uh, circles or arenas, but these are always termed as being non-religious. The uh, one final slide to uh, give this uh, to you know quote some of the the uh, some some key writers on on this uh, you know the, the, on the field of critical religious studies. So Talal Asad in his classic book by now, the genealogies of religion, writes that religion was gradually compelled to concede the domain of public power to the constitution state and of public truth to national science. In this movement, we have the construction of religion as a new historical object, anchored in person experience, expressible as belief statements, dependent on private institutions and practiced in one's spare time. This construction of religion ensures that it is part of what is inessential to our common politics, economy, science, and rationality. Uh, Shahab Ahmed in his book, What is Islam, uh, sums up what, what has been uh, uh, a an ongoing discussion in critical religious studies for the past two decades or so, where he says that when we speak of religion today, we, we do two things. One, to speak of religion is to constitute objects as religions by modeling them on the Christian European historical experience and thus on Christianity, that particularly Protestant Christianity, that becomes the template of uh, a religion on which other religions are uh, also seen through. Uh, number two, Whenever we use the term religion, we assume the validity often speak in terms of the necessary accompanying binary category, the secular, the non-religious, the political, the, the, the uh, economic, uh, the practical even. So uh, Timothy Fitzgerald in his book, The Ideology of Religious Studies, uh, talks about this, that, you know, we would think that, uh, you know, if, if you think that religion is something which is concerned primarily with transcendental values, then this is something which is also a feature of the secular sphere. Okay, he says that the secular itself is a sphere of transcendental values, but the invention of religion, you know, the, the manufacturing of religion as the locus of the transcendent, i.e. religion being that which has, which is the main, uh, whose main preoccupation is the transcendent. So the secular itself is a sphere of transcendental values, but the invention and manufacturing of religion as the locus of the transcendent serves to disguise this and strengthen the illusion that the secular is simply the real world seen aright in all its self-evident factuality. So we come to the end of our discussion. Uh, briefly, this is about Project Noon, uh, uh, where, which represents a project of dialogical exploration. Uh, mostly I've had conversations with uh, leading scholars in Hinduism and Islam. Uh, again, when I'm using these terms Hinduism and Islam, I'm trying uh, using them only for the ease of simplicity, uh, because as we mentioned, uh, these uh, you know to to use such reified categories or such unified or such solidified categories of uh, would not be uh, uh, historically and sociologically accurate. Uh, but broadly, Hindu-Muslim dialogue is is the uh, 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 is the area of focus or the of exploration on Project Noon, uh, and mainly through dialogical encounters or through uh, through conversing with academic scholars uh, who are also mostly uh, practitioners of particular religions. So the aspect of the of faith is also involved, uh, as well as uh, having an academic uh, you know, structure or academic uh, grounding in our discussion. So if you if you're interested in exploring some of these themes, uh, 
these are a few conversations which I would recommend on our uh, website or on, on our YouTube channel, which you can explore, which uh, deal more uh, more uh, directly or in, in a different way with some of the questions which we have been exploring today. So with that, uh, I think we can again open it up to any discussion or any any criticism as well. I'm open to take. Thank you. So uh, just uh, curious, why did you call it Project Known? Uh, uh, right. Right. Um, so, uh, well, this this goes back to uh, an essay by a thinker known by the name of René Guénon, who was a French uh, scholar of the early 20th century. Uh, he uh, wrote a lot on uh, various religions, on Hinduism, Islam, uh, uh, and he he has a he has an essay on the the mystical significance of the, of the letter known. And he belongs to a school of thought known as the traditionalist or the perennialist school of thought, uh, which again, I mean, any of these schools uh, which were created about a hundred years ago are not without their problems. Uh, but the the broader idea, uh, I mean, th there's much of benefit in their writings. Again, what what is uh, there in the in the essay uh, about the letter known in Arabic language is that. Uh, the, uh, I mean, for him and for for Genon, who was a you know keen or a very uh, close student of both Islam and Hinduism, uh, for for him these two religions represent uh, one the oldest and the youngest, uh, you know, major world religions, uh, and you know, and he he, he would he would uh, categorize them in the uh, in in terms of the uh, Hindu cycles of time, the Manvantaras. Uh, and and he, he would say that you know in, in our cycle of time these these represent the, the earliest and the oldest uh, and uh, uh, the the letter noon comes into into play over here because one end of noon represents uh, the earliest one and the other end represents the the youngest one and the the center in, in between represents the transcendent reality which both are trying to uh, come towards and which is beyond. Uh, which is which is the concern for both of these ends, right? So this is a more speculative answer about why it was it known. Thank you. That's that wonderful. So we we do have uh, some people, uh, you know, um, I think Sonal's camera is off, but uh, Sonal uh, works a lot with uh, also interface um, dialogue, you know, in uh, she. Uh, yeah, so we are going to open the floor uh, to questions. Um, you can just unmute yourself today and ask. Uh, so I can see uh, Munir, Munir uh, or, or, or you know, I think Munir, just maybe you're first on my screen. So maybe you can just unmute and uh, if you have comments, questions, or at least introduce yourself and then you can have your question. Yeah. Out. So uh, thank you, Dr. Saad, for this uh, session. Uh, I have some comments, and uh, maybe it's me only who is a bit, I, I would say, confused, if that's the right term. Uh, in that, that uh, what your topic uh, suggested, Al-Biruni and his prompts for interfaith dialogue, and what you vacillated from, uh, you know, uh, Al-Biruni uh, to his book on India and then to phenomenology and the phenomenologists and eventually to the problematic of the term religion. First of all, there are many questions, but I would like you to first clarify where do you stand in between them? Are you the critique of a religious problematic term? Are you a phenomenologist which you're supposed to critique again then? What are you intending to do? Because I do, don't think this was a, you know, a, it uh, the uh, contents of it were absolutely academic and it was an academic lecture but to get to the root of what we get from this lecture in order to substantiate ourselves in the philosophy of dialogue i would like you to tell me where do you stand in between them and how do we process this thank you all right no i think uh, that's a really good uh, question uh, a question which uh, uh, 
uh, I think I have not I've not tried to ask myself because uh, I have not tried to put my own uh, person into the center of you know uh, looking at for, for example I mean, if the if the concern is what what does uh, Albiruni do in his book and what do phenomenologists do uh, then it matters little what I believe so my uh, uh, concern was to present them as they are for example I mean doing phenomenology. Uh, but then, if you ask me uh, at a more personal level, what I believe, you know, where do I stand in, in all this? Uh, I would say that uh, uh, I mean, there is certainly much of benefit in terms of interfaith dialogue, which I which I try to derive from Albiruni's book in the in, in the first few points which I mentioned. Although I also mentioned certain criticisms of the book and of the method, I also mentioned certain positive points which I could derive. Uh, similarly, there were certain positive points about phenomenology as a method. Uh, I think a, a rehabilitated phenomenology and a rehabilitated Al-Biruni's method would be something which, which is very useful for us. Uh, you know, taking their limitations and overcoming them or, you know, trying to move beyond them and taking... Uh, uh, so, I mean, if, if, you're, if you're able to overcome those limitations, for example, of, of not being able to uh, be aware of your own positionality or where you're coming from and how what you're bringing to the table influences what you're already studying, uh, so, I mean, if you're more self-aware, then I think definitely phenomenology and, and you know, I'll be, I mean, all of these are two extremely very, very different things. But I think I was able to highlight slightly how uh, there are you know, interesting overlaps between the modern uh, phenom phenomenological method in religious studies and Albiruni's own method. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm actually not, not the first one to talk about this. Uh, Professor Arvind Sharma, uh, who's a leading scholar in Hinduism and Hindu studies, uh, has also written a uh, hefty volume on uh, Albiruni, and he has uh, termed Albiruni as a proto phenomenologist or a pioneer of the field of phenomenology because he's writing on these things at that time. Uh, so, I mean, people have tried to fit him in that category. Uh, although, I mean, I, I think that this category itself is not is not unproblematic. Uh, Ultimately, it, it, it only means that we need to use all these terms. We need to use Albiruni's method, phenomenology, and the, even the word religion, even the word Hinduism, Islam. We, we need to use these terms, even though these are uh, problematic terms. But we need to be using them uh, while we're aware of their problematic aspect. Being self-aware is enough to uh, move forward, I think so. Moni, if you can just introduce yourself as well. Yeah, uh, sorry, I, I forgot to introduce. Uh, so I'm Munir, I'm basically, uh, I'm from Kashmir. Uh, I have recently submitted my PhD uh, in religious studies, comparative religions and civilizations mm -hmm. from Jana Milia. And uh, I, the work I have done pertains to phenomenology as well as it's uh, regarding Emmanuel Levinas, direct student mm -hmm. of Hustel and Heidegger. Right. So I have been, uh, I have, my research is, is on him only. So that's why I was, you know, a little curious to know about these things. So there are many questions, but I would like first other people to go, and if there is time, then I'll come back to them. No, no, I think I, I would, I would really value any uh, any further critical comments from the side. Yeah, I, I will definitely go ahead, but uh, I would like uh, other participants to go because we don't have much time. So let them go, in and then I, I can, go. yeah. Yeah, Poonam. Uh... You are outside, which means you probably have questions. Uh, just introduce yourself and <laughs> you can ask. Uh, yes. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much, first of all, for such an elaborative session. Uh, for me, I am naive in, in this area. Uh, I, I am Poonam and I am studying economics. I am doing PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University. So this was something new for me. And many of the terms you used, I heard for the first time. Uh, but I am very much interested in the spirituality. So I was like, it was very, uh, uh, I don't know how to explain, but there was many terms and many, like, uh, as you explained, uh, Albrun is uh, like uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, part that where impartiality, how he was refraining himself, bringing his own like biases in the in the things he was writing and he was explaining. So uh, that is something also in, in like in uh, how the Buddha says that um, see reality as it is. And like I, I, I found it 
some kind of unity and emergence in the all the religion at certain point of time uh, and also as you said that the uh, using the words like in 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 the end of their your lecture you asked about the religion what is the religion when i thought about it i found it like religion is the, is a way of uh, like faith way, way of uh, worship so then then why it is problematic using the words like hindu hindu islam and christian like you said that using these words are problematic i don't think there is problem in like following any religion when we compare and we say that this is superior than other then there is problem like I, that's how i think so uh, could you explain that why it is problematic right yeah well uh, firstly uh... Thank you for those uh, kind words and uh, for your, uh, you know, uh, that that you know you could relate to it at a spiritual level, because I think uh, ultimately that is uh, uh, at the heart of all of these methods as well. You know, for example, if we saw an Albinonian, we saw in, in one of the phenomenologists that uh, you know a grace from God in in Christians and or in Albinonia, a spiritual cultivation is necessary in order to uh, really understand or really get to the heart of religious traditions that you're studying. So uh, also, I mean, when, when you're saying about, when you're talking about Buddha, right, saying that, uh, seeing things as they are, uh, this reminded me of, there, there's also one uh, prayer which the Prophet Muhammad used to say, uh, uh, my Lord, show me things as they are. Seeing things as they are. So, Rabbi Arin al haqqa haqqan, this is the Arabic word. So, uh, I mean, there is definitely a very important spiritual aspect to all of this. To all of this, uh, uh, the, the only the, the sense in which I'm saying that you know, uh, using terms like Islam or Hinduism is problematic, is is not to say that Islam and Hinduism are problematic. So uh, uh, I'm not I'm not being critical of religion or of you know uh, various religions or religious people, uh, because I'm a Muslim myself. Uh, but. Uh, I mean, uh, what what it means to say that these are problematic is that is to say that when we use these terms naively, that might be a problem. When we use these terms without understanding how what okay for for example what we think of Islam today or what we think of Hinduism today, uh, uh, is it the same uh, Islam or Hinduism that a person one thousand years ago would also think of, about, or is it or I mean what what is different in my own modern understanding of these things? Because I am a person situated at a particular time in history. And my understanding is uh, influenced by various, uh, you know, uh, social historical factors in modernity, and I am bringing a certain inflection to my to my answer of what is Islam, what is Hinduism. So I mean, to problematize it is to say is to is to only sharpen our understanding. It is not to say that these religions are problematic. It is to uh, perceive these religions as they are themselves by uh, seeing what are the implicit biases which we bring into. Uh, our thinking about these religions. For example, when we think about Islam, we, we uh, tend to think about a very particular idea of what uh, religion, of, you know, uh, of what it is. Now, I, I'm not saying that, that this idea is right or wrong. I'm just saying that this particular idea emerged in a certain point in history, uh, and and you know, and, uh, and you know, uh, our position in modernity uh, has a large part to play in it. Uh, for example, textualism uh, that you know. Uh, 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 was being mentioned previously was uh, is a is a problem. I mean, why was Albiruni such a textualist? Right, was one of the problems that we we're, that were discussing. So, uh, uh, textualism is again a problem which is reemerging in modern in, in modernity, or which which has re which which had actually reemerged about a hundred years ago because uh, people were going towards a more positivistic bent or a more scientific bent where, it, where where religion was seen as a superstition. Uh, and so anything which was rational and empirical was being accepted. Uh, I mean, now we are moving slightly away from that. But 100 years ago, this was the, the trend. And in that sense, again, textualism was arising. And, you know, if you look at all the important thinkers of the uh, the, the early Orientalist writers on religion, uh, you know, Max Mueller and all these people, they were uh, incredible textualists and philologists. They were study students of, you know, uh, language and, uh, you know, focus entirely on texts. So I mean, this was the approach that they they also had. So I mean, the the reason why someone is a, is a textualist, or, or the reason why someone tends to see religion a certain way, not another way, has a lot to do with their historical, social historical context. Is what I'm saying. 
thank you for your question uh, were you was this uh, satisfactory answer you can add anything else if you want <laughs> yes yes thank you sir thank you okay so i think we can uh, we have uh, uh, one question or maybe two at max we have time for sir munir if you want to go ahead you can uh, go ahead and then we can wrap up with it yeah sure thank you ma'am again so uh, sir i would like uh, to know certain things that in phenomenology don't you think the absolute alterity of what constitutes religious is compromised and you know the transcendentalism the god as a transcendent i won't say phenomena because phenomena itself compromises the very notion of transcendence so isn't it a very compromised uh, method for uh, studying religion first and second in the eidetic uh, phenomenology how do we see what is essential and what's not because the things that are manifestations of our, uh, the eminent religion eminent uh, religion those are more of a relative things and so therefore the essential and non essential is you know relative to everybody uh, to muslims uh, for some women for parda is very essential and to some it's just a rudimentary thing so how do we do that and suppose with the terms islam or other things like hinduism is not a term that is that we found, find in uh, vedas or upanishads but islam is a term that is given by god itself by allah itself so what do we do then do we consider it as a problematic and consider muslims what they consider as problematic and regarding al biruni i would like you to uh, as you rightly mentioned that al biruni was Uh, he considered hinduism or you know uh, idolaters as the deviations uh, he was going from monotheistic thought so if a person like uh, him who already has this uh, prism in him as he considers uh, uh, hinduism or idolatries or uh, heathens or pagans as deviations is it right or is it even ethical to consider him as a you know prototype or an exemplary Uh, to constitute a method or uh, to constitute a philosophy of interfaith dialogue i would like to your comment comments on that thank you all right uh, these are all really good questions they're really difficult questions uh, and i don't know if i remember every question so i'll just take one by one and if if i forget something you can, you can fill me up uh, i'll take the middle question first about islam um so um uh, i mean uh, it is true that uh, the term islam emerges i mean it's there in the quran uh, and uh, you know this is i mean th the term is not something which is uh, created in modernity right uh, and i don't mean to imply that it is either so all that i want to say that i mean i'm not saying islam is problematic i mean this is different <clears throat> what i'm saying is uh, the way we use the word islam today is naive that is what i mean to say it is uh, it is not uh, it doesn't take into account uh, uh, various uh, you know complexities of socio religious or historical nature that is all i mean to say when i when i'm saying that it is problematic okay. uh, well also uh, in, in the case of islam you, you would say that uh, while the quran talks about islam uh you know for example there are, there are many verses in the quran one was saying that uh, uh, the only uh you know the the way acceptable before god is that of islam right uh, in adina in the law of islam uh, uh, uh and you know this comes you know somewhere in surah al imran i think so in the third chapter i mean this if you notice uh, this is being this comes in the middle of the quranic revelation i mean while the quran is being revealed it is referring to this islam so this islam which is being referred in that verse uh is before the completion of the quran itself right uh and before the entire you know the, the, the whole quran is completely revealed uh, uh and i mean that, that is one thing and then the, the other thing is that you know the islam that we that we know today or that we encounter today is not unmediated Uh, we are encountering it through the mediation of uh, a historical uh, link or historical or historical channels of the, the, the medium of history uh, i mean how it has received how we have received it through throughout the agents uh, through the ages sorry 
sorry uh, i mean in in that sense our islam uh, may not be the same as you know islam uh, as it was at the time of the revelation of the prophet i mean i mean our understanding of islam is is what i mean to say uh, and again i mean there's there is no single understanding in that sense of what you know muslims believe was muslims across uh, you know social religious contexts or you know uh, societies cultures believe different things uh, but this is a this is a separate question and this is a uh, you know, sorry what was your other question again uh, one one more question and take one at a time and yeah. I'll, I'll also try to be brief now this time sir it was about uh, the you know figuring out what is essential in a religion uh, right right so uh, well uh, this, is, this is a really good question because the uh, i mean the eidetic method part of phenomenology is problematic from a socio constructivist point of view uh, because again you're trying to essentialize uh, something and you're you're trying to get at the essence of uh, various diverse socio historical realities which itself is a very problematic endeavor in itself whether or not it's successful is a different thing the the whole question itself is problematic so this is one of the the criticisms which emerges against phenomenology in modern times uh, and so a rehabilitated phenomenology would uh, go beyond this or would uh, overcome this or would not be stuck to this this I mean, this is a highly problematic part of it so this husserlian legacy of phenomenology is, is again problematic therefore uh, the method which christian sen stands for the person which we discussed there were two kinds of people which we discussed one was the descriptive phenomenologist and the uh, more philosophical or the eidetic kind of phenomenologist so the eidetic one is more problematic but the descriptive one uh, uh, is uh, you know is less problematic certainly and you know we have uh, i mean much from that method can can also be salvaged for example the, the idea of bracketing or epoch or all these things are important ideas right. thank you so thank you so much dr sand uh, you know for for being so patient and uh, answering all the questions and uh, and uh, we have just one request if you can share your presentation uh, if it's possible uh, with uh, to us then i mean uh, because there were a lot of uh, you know writings that i think of, i think this is the kind of uh, session that uh, uh, people need to kind of um, uh, process a little and then probably like punam said there are a lot of words that she uh, didn't uh, you know understand maybe she can pick them up and you know Go more to it. So, if it's possible to share, we would. Really no, definitely, yeah. I'll, uh, I will share the uh, PPT with you as well as uh, some articles or something. So, you know, if those who are interested can. Wonderful. Look this up. Thank you so much, Doctor Saad. Thank I, you for I, the invitation and thank you for everyone for uh, patiently listening to me. <laughs> I hope it uh, made some sense and I hope it was of some benefit. Yes, yes, it was extremely uh, interesting and and it was very different from what the sessions have been before this. so uh, it it added a lot of diversity and a lot of uh, different perspectives and i think everybody thank you again for joining us